So welcome back to our last video about the Gaussian plume model. And in this video, I'm going to introduce the idea of applying the Gaussian plume model to a real world situation. So consider the following problem. Um, <clears throat> you're tasked with um, citing the location uh, of a new school along Main Street. And the challenge here is that there is a power plant that currently exists off Main Street at some distance uh, to the west. And uh, they want to cite the, uh, the school where, where the pollution is not going to be a problem. So Main Street runs north-south. The wind is pr pr predominantly from the west. So that will most of the time be our x direction. And there's some distance uh, that the street is downwind. Uh, so there's some distance x in that direction. So question is, how can we use our Gaussian plume diffusion model to choose the location for the school that reduces risk? So where to put the school? So how do we figure that out? So first of all, what we would want to do is think about uh, how we want to vary. Uh, yeah, we want to basically solve for the concentration as a function of location on the school, location along the y direction, given a specific x. And furthermore, we have a specific z in mind, which is generally we build schools on the ground. Uh, so z is going to be zero because we're going to put the school at the ground or it could be the you know the height of the building but anyway you know relative to the height of the smokestack z is going to be small um, for practical purposes we'll put it on the ground we have a fixed downwind direction x and so for a given uh, x we can solve for uh, sigma y and sigma z we're going to vary well, you know initially we'll start with a single wind speed and emissions rate and so we'll be able to solve, we'll be able to, you know, everything will be fixed except y, and we'll vary this along y. That would give us a first answer. Uh, I would ask, is that really the only answer? Because we also need to realize that that solution under the average wind speed and the average emissions rate and the average wind direction will vary as we vary wind speed. It'll vary as we vary stability class. It'll vary with uh, the stack height, which is going to change with wind speed, temperature, and pressure. Uh, and so the question then becomes, what do we actually care about here? Do we really care about the average class where we put in the average value for each of these things? Or do we care about the worst case? And what, where, what, what would lead to the worst case? Or in kind of how do we think about the uncertainty here? So. Let's start with a simple version of this. Uh, where is the surface concentration the greatest? Uh, and where is it above some legal standard? So let's assume uh, for this particular exercise, I'm going to work with the, the PPM, the particulate matter. Uh, sorry, sorry, PM. The PM, there's a PM25 and a PM10 for two different classes of particulate sizes. But let's say we have some EPA standard that this describes uh, the particulate ma matter that we can be exposed to. And in fact, I'll, as I'll bring up later, there's actually two relevant standards. One is the, the mean annual exposure, and then the, the uh, other is the daily maximum exposure, which will both become relevant. So how would we answer this question of where the concentration is the greatest? Um, you know, how would you answer that? What would your code contain? What tables or graphs would you need to draw? Okay, so here's one thing you could start with. So here is graphs of how concentration of the pollutant changes <clears throat> as a function of downwind direction <clears throat> uh, for different lateral locations. So let's first focus on this top curve, which not surprisingly is when y equals zero. Uh, 
So the concentrations are always going to be worst in the in the directly downwind direction. Um, now the shape here, uh, we, we now have a shape that's decidedly not a Gaussian, um, and it takes on this shape because at distance zero, um, we actually don't see very much pollution at the ground because the pollution is all up at the effective stack height. And so we see, what we see is that as we move downwind, the amount of pollution actually initially goes up. And that's because we have this initial diffusion of the pollutant from the stack height down to the ground. And then it reaches some maximum at some distance. And then it's going to decline after that as the pollutant disperses away. So we see that and we also see, um, it, we can also infer that the, the actual point that it reaches that maximum is gonna vary with all the things we've talked about. It's gonna vary with the things that affect the dispersion coefficient. So atmospheric, you know, under unstable atmospheres, you'll get more mixing and thus you'll peak sooner and then disperse out, but you'll also dilute out more quickly. Um, and with stable atmospheric conditions, you're going to disperse more slowly in the vertical direction, uh, which means it's going to take longer until you hit that peak, but it's also going to be uh, slower to, to disperse outward. So the concentrations will go down more slowly. Now, if we look laterally away from that main line, one thing we'll notice is the peak uh, actually, well, first, not surprisingly, the the mount goes down. So as we move out laterally from directly downwind to 100 meters to the side, 200 meters, 300 meters, 400 meters, um, that concentration goes down because now you're spread, now you have to deal not with just, just the vertical spreading out, but also the horizontal spreading out. The other thing we see is that the distance before you reach the peak shifts as well. So you know, the, if the peak occurs you know, here for directly downwind as we move 100 meters over, it peaks a little bit later. 200 meters over, it peaks later. 300 meters it peaks later. 400 meters it peaks later because you now you have not just the time that it takes to get downwind, but you also have to get out laterally because that kind of makes sense. Um, you need that additional time as you move farther laterally for, for things to spread out. Now, if we pick any particular distance, uh, let's say we knew that we were, you know, two kilometers downwind, we could then say, well, at two kilometers downwind, what is what does the concentration look like as we move out laterally? And so, specifically, we could plot. Uh, so, so at each point, distance downwind, we, we could be we could make a plot of the lateral dispersion. Um, and we'll see that that lateral dispersion at any partic particular downwind location, and again, with Z set to zero, because we're doing this at the ground, now that does look like a Gaussian curve. And so we have this curve that de describes uh, how concentration varies uh, to the north in the positive direction, to the south in the negative direction. It's symmetric and it looks Gaussian. And then we have, in this case, this EPA standard, which is the annual mean standard. And we can say that uh, there's some point where you pass that threshold. And so it would be legal to cite uh, the school at any point past that threshold. And obviously, the further you can go north or south away uh, from the coal-fired power plant, the lower the concentration the pollutant is going to be. So again, this solution was reached by plugging in the means of everything. You know, the mean wind speed, the mean di wind direction, the mean emissions, the mean temperature, mean the mean pressure, the mean uh, atmospheric stability. But it should be noted that many of those things are going to change on a day-to-day -day basis. So how would we do that? Well, here is an example are some probability distributions describing how those things might change. A wind speed might vary, might be slower on some days, higher and some days wind direction might change. And here, you know, might predominantly be 90 degrees, you know, uh, 
to the to pointing east, but some days it's a bit going a bit farther north. Some days it's going a bit farther south. Uh, temperature varies. Atmospheric pressure varies. Here, light has distinct peaks because we're thinking about those three classes of um, strong, immediate, intermediate, and weak. And cloud cover, you know, was just a, a yes or no in our lookup table. And so those were our cases of yes and no. So it's one centered on zero, the other centered on one. So they're actually zero and one variables. So now we have distributions for all these things. And so to actually make a prediction, um, we could apply the Gaussian plume model not once under the mean conditions, but we could do some sort of Monte Carlo where we sampled all these different input conditions and ran the model under each of them to kind of see that uh, things are not the same every day. And so here's an example. If I plot the predictions at on the on the street at the location in the center of, center of the distribution, so at zero. So y equals zero, x equals the downwind direction, distance from the power plant to the road, z equals zero. But we're sampling over all the other things, so we actually get a distribution of all the other things. And so we see things like, here's where that EPA annual limit was. Uh, we see that there's actually a whole lot of uh, days that end up above that limit. And we actually see that this daily limit now becomes uh, relevant as well. We see a lot of days that get above that daily limit. So that when we plug in the mean, we can only really see what's happening and on the annual scale. When we plug in individual days, we see that there could be a lot of variability from day to day. And there could be many, you know, even though this point, you know, if we go back here, so first of all, this annual limit is at uh, 1.5. Uh, the daily limit's at 0.5. We can see that uh, the mean never gets above that uh, daily limit, but on, on average, it never does. But there's still, that means there are plenty of days that exceed that. And this shape definitely is not normal. You wouldn't want to describe it just by the mean of this. So we could do this sort of calculation, not just at that center location, but we would have a distribution at every place along the street as well. So this figure now shows the result of both what we get when we plug in the analytical mean, which is this uh, brighter blue, uh, what we get when we calculate the mean in this Monte Carlo simulation, um, which spreads things out which makes sense because some days the wind is blowing uh, north and some days the wind is blowing a bit more south. And we also see that uh, if we look at individual days, uh, the daily peak has a, a much broader distribution. And it turns out that in fact, the sighting of the school is more determined by that daily peak threshold here than it was by the mean threshold, which was much tighter. So this is showing that um, you know, while you can take these sorts of equations and plug individual numbers into them, uh, this kind of Monte Carlo approach that lets us sample over the inputs can often really change the answer. And so here we see that, that it's that daily peak exposure, that, you know, that day of the year where you get the perfect storm of wind blowing right at the school and instead of down perpendicular to Main Street and, you know, say the stability classes and uh, you know, uh, wind directions and wind speeds all add up to kind of get that peak pointed right at the school. Cool, so this is again, an example of showing uh, both how to apply the Gaussian plume model and showing that how we can use the things we learned earlier in the class about you know, sampling our uncertainties uh, to you know, run these sorts of models in ensembles uh, and, and make not just one prediction, but whole distributions of predictions. Thanks.